Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining another episode of NLP with Friends. Um, today we are very excited to host Hong Ming Zhang. Uh, he's a first PhD student at HKUSD and a visiting scholar at UPenn. Um, he received multiple fellowships uh, from Hong Kong PhD uh, fellowship and Microsoft Research uh, Asia fellowship to support his research on common sense reasoning and open domain event understanding. Uh, so before we start, I'll just remind you uh, that if you have any questions during the talk, uh, please raise your hand and we'll handle it uh, with Hong Ming that will answer the question. Uh, and after his talk, um, we support either question that you can ask yourself or uh, through Dory that uh, Lasha posted the link to uh, earlier. And with that, I think we can start. So Hong Ming. Okay, thanks. Uh, hello everyone, this is Hong Ming. Today, I'm very glad to share our recent research on common sense reasoning from the angle of eventualities. So I think first of all, I want to thank Yanai for the invitation and all the other organizers for the great effort and NES organization. So, oops. Okay, so yes, I think I can start. Okay, so actually the common sense has really been a very popular term in both the NLP and AI community recently. So uh, what does it really mean? Okay, so based on the definition given by ConceptNet, for ordinary people, it basically means that uh, the good judgment about the world around us. But in the AI community, it is used as a kind of technical term referring to millions of basic facts and understanding possessed by most people. And one unique property of the common sense knowledge is that it is often omitted from the social communications because we always assume that the reader or listener will have the same knowledge, so we won't state out. So some examples are like, if you forget someone's birthday, they may be unhappy with you or birds can fly, but books cannot. So basically different from the factual knowledge, like Obama was the president of the United States, which is always true. The common sense knowledge are not inevitably true. For example, if this person is your friend and he really understands that you are very busy recently, so he may not be angry about you. Or like some of the birds cannot fly, like chicken cannot. Um, actually understanding the common sense is crucial for many downstream natural language understanding tasks. Here, I simply show that with two examples. One is from this uh, Vinogradsma challenge, which is a kind of pronoun reference resolution task. Given two sentences, the fish ate the worm, it was hungry or tasty. Actually, these two sentences are very similar to each other. There is only one word difference, but you can see here the answer is totally reversed. Like in the first one, we should resolve eat to the fish, while the second one to the worm, because hungry is a common property of something eat, while tasty is a common property of something, be, something being eaten. Another example is from this common sense QA data set, like where would I not want a fox, a hen house or the others? Um, I guess the answer should be the first one because fox may eat hen and that is something we do not want. As you can see here, with all the support of this knowledge we have, answering these questions would become very challenging. So, yeah, so recently many efforts have been devoted into understanding the common sense knowledge. Take the Vino Grand Schema Challenge as an example. Yeah, here. Uh, as I mentioned, WSC can really be viewed as a kind of two candidate multiple choice problem. So the random guess, line, random guess baseline is basically 50%. In the early stage, people have been struggling on this task. So for example, this knowledge hunting framework, even though it has been trained to use knowledge from Google, the overall performance is still not very, not very satisfying because only a small portion of the common sense knowledge is explicitly expressed, even in all the data Google has. Later on, Google, another work from Google tries to use a traditional language model to solve the WC problems, but it seems like it's still not strong enough. And after that, uh, GPT-2 was proposed and achieved much better performance in an unsupervised way, which is quite impressive. Actually, besides GPT, another important breakthrough in the NLP community recently is the mass language model, like BERT, and WC is not an exception. People actually figured out that we can find twin Bert or Roberta on similar data sets like DPR or Vino Grande and achieve very good performance, especially the combination of here, the Vino Grande uh, and the Roberta. It achieves over 90% accuracy, which is already similar to human performance. But then naturally one question could come to our mind that 
Does this mean that we have already solved the common sense reasoning problem? Well, I'm afraid the answer might be no, because as discussed by the Winner Grande paper, given two data sets, the original WSC and Winner Grande, we humans couldn't really tell the difference, but the models can achieve near human performance on one data set while much worse performance on the other one. But we have no clue about what is going on here. So to figure out that and investigate how well these models can truly understand common sense in ACL this year, we propose a challenging task called Reno Y, which is actually developed on top of the original WSC data sets. Here is one example. If you still remember, WSC is really a pronoun reference resolution task that requires a model to understand the common sense knowledge behind. So the Reno Y task is defined as follows. For each WSC question, we require the model to select the correct reasons for answering that question uh, from several very similar but wrong answers, uh, wrong reasons. The motivation is that you cannot only solve the problem, you also need to solve it with the correct reason. So for example, the fish ate the worm, it was hungry, it refers to fish because uh, we provide three reasons here, which are collected from different resources, of course, like hungry things tend to eat, but this one is the correct one, or worm is the one being eaten. It is correct, but it's not really the reason. The third one is the worm is a common name for a variety of fish, which is automatically generated by GT2, but it does not really make sense to me. Um, yeah, as for the results, we surprisingly found out that all models are struggling on this task, even though the best performing model, Roberta plus Vino Grande here, which actually correctly answer 90% of the WC questions can only correctly answer less than 60% of the Vino Y questions. This results actually implies that achieving good performance on the WSC task does not really mean that these models have understand the common sense knowledge behind these questions, at least not in a way how humans understand them. It also implies that there is still a long way to go for us to fully solve the common sense reasoning problem. To better solve the common sense reasoning problem, we need to take a step back to think about what are we missing here. So first of all, I would like to say that we are missing a good representation methodology for common sense knowledge. Obviously triplets leveraging the human defined relations like concept net is not enough to cover all the common sense knowledge and we need something better than that. Okay, so from my point of view, a good representation methodology should be able to fulfill the following requirements. First, it should be accurate and has large coverage. Second, it should be human friendly. Otherwise, it is hard for humans to tell its quality and curate them. Third, it should also be machine friendly. Otherwise, our system cannot easily use the common sense knowledge. Um, besides that, we are also lack of a good uh, acquisition method, which should be scalable because we may have huge amount of such knowledge and it should be easy to extend because the world is changing and we may have some new knowledge from time to time. So basically in this talk, I will try to solve, I mean, answer these two questions by pr presenting uh, an eventuality based common sense knowledge representation methodology and a corresponding acquisition method. So here is the outline of my presentation today. I will first try to give a clear definition about the common sense knowledge we care about and how to represent them with the pair of the selection preference over eventualities. And then I will introduce how to construct such a knowledge graph from textual data. After that, I will spend some time introducing how can we further enhance it with some other techniques like other knowledge graphs or visual signals. In the end, I will show some applications of this knowledge graph. Okay, so the first question we are trying to answer here is that what is really the common sense knowledge we care about? I guess one definition everyone would accept is that the common sense is about the knowledge shared by most people. And that is how it is called common. And it's often reflecting their understanding about the daily life rather than a specific domain. But still this definition is not good enough because there is no clear boundary between what knowledge belongs to common sense and what is not. And thus it's too weak for us to design an effective representation methodology such that the machines can understand. Okay, so to figure out a better definition of the common sense knowledge, I'm going to use this very old example again. I'm sure many of you have seen it. So assume that this is the circle representing all human knowledge. Uh, when you were just born, you basically know nothing about this world. So you are this cross here. And then 
several years later, you start to know a little bit about the world. Like you know that dogs can bark, birds can fly, and some food is yummy. You know that when you cry, your parents will panic and they will come to see what happens to you because they love you. And then you go to school, you learn about music, you learn about math, you learn about sports, you learn some basic stuff about all majors. And then 18 years pass, you went to college, you start to have to choose your own major, like geography, sports, or computer science, like most of us. At this stage, your knowledge about this specific domain will grow very fast to the boundary of human knowledge. And then if you keep working and you are lucky enough, you will be able to make a small breakthrough. And this small breakthrough usually makes you a PhD. Okay, but that is not something I'm gonna to discuss today. What I'm trying to say with this example is that the purpose of common sense reasoning is just helping machines to understand this small red circle here and nothing else. Okay, so let's see several examples to see if we can identify some clear boundary to help us distinguish the common sense knowledge against others. So for example, Paris is the capital of France, does not belong to the common sense knowledge because it's really a kind of geography knowledge. Well, you may know this one because Paris is very popular, but I guess very few of us here can know the capital of all countries in this world. Similarly, uh, Olympic 2012 was held in London, should also be a kind of domain specific knowledge because you will know this only when you are interested in sports. Um, last but not least, we cannot say that bird is a strong tool, it's a piece of common sense because it only makes sense to NLP people, right? Because for ordinary people, bird is just a cartoon character. So if you compare this domain specific knowledge with the common sense knowledge, like if you forget someone's birthday, they may be unhappy with you, you can actually find out that the domain specific knowledge is often about name entities or terms because you need very strict definition about your talk, what you're talking about. And they are often about facts, like um, they are always true, at least under certain requirements. As a comparison, the common sense knowledge is often just a kind of preference about our daily life, not those terms. So let's go a little bit deeper and try to think about where could such preference happen. So based on Jikendorf's semantic theory, the semantic meaning in our language can be described as a finite set of mental primitives and a finite set of mental combinations. And actually, the primitive units could include many things. So the first kind of primitive unit are things or entities, for example, cat. We all know what cat is about. It's a kind of animal, oh, here, um, that are very cute and have four legs, two eyes, two ears, one tail, etc. Besides that, another important primitive unit is the state, such as the cat is cute or the cat is smiling. Actually, I think it is fair to say that our understanding about things can really be reflected via states because um, the semantic about these things is really just the union of all possible states that it could appear seen. So basically the states are describing certain properties of things. Okay, so everything we have introduced so far are static. However, I think the world is changing, it's dynamic. So that's why we also need to understand events. So basically events are describing the changing of states. I think it is fun to view it as a kind of derivative of states maybe. Um, yeah, such as the cat is running. It changed from one state to another one. Actually, there are many interesting things we know or we have preference about this event. For example, the cat is running in such a hurry might because it sees some delicious food or it suddenly wakes and sees some weird guy is trying to make a video of it and it just got scared. Um, I think so to conclude, our current research on common sense reasoning is trying to understand humans' preference about things, states, and events. Considering that knowledge about things can be effectively expressed by states and events, uh, whose overall term is called this eventuality, we can say that the common sense knowledge we care about so far is really about the preference about eventualities. So naturally the next question would be how to represent and acquire such preference so that the machines can understand. To answer this question, we need to think about how are this kind of preference is expressed in human language. So based on the lower bound of semantic theory, uh, if you remove the grammar from the linguistic description, we will get the semantics. So basically understanding language requires both speakers knowledge about his language, basically the grammar, 
and his knowledge about the world, basically the common sense knowledge you care about. Okay, so here are some examples. As you can see here, there are three sentences. Should we take the junior back to the zoo? Should we take the lawn back to the zoo? Should we take the bus back to the zoo? These three sentences share the exactly same grammar structure, yet they are describing totally different events, uh, which may have totally different reasons, effect, or like sub events uh, steps. So if we provide a little bit more context here, like it is so dangerous, which one of this is most likely to be the next sentence? I would like to vote for the second one because line is often very dangerous. I think this uh, example shows that when the grammar is controlled, over selection can be used to reflect over understanding about junior line and the bus, which is exactly the common sense knowledge we are trying to capture here. So historically, people used to call such grammar-based uh, semantic or preference with the term selectional preference or semantic fit in some other literatures. So basically, it is a kind of relaxation of the selection re restrictions and is often used as an important kind of syntax features. Originally, it was only uh, applied to the is a hierarchy in, in, in word net, sorry, and verb object relations. Actually, the idea of selectional preference is very simple. We control the grammar, like the direct object dependency relation, and its head, basically the verb. Humans should have preference about the argument it can be connected to. With this formulation, we can easily use the frequency or plausibility scores we assign to different combinations to reflect humans' preference. And here are two examples. Like cat is more likely to be a kind of animal rather than the plant. So if one model or knowledge graph can manage to assign hair score to the first combination rather than second one, we can claim that it understands this piece of human knowledge. Similarly, if a model manages to assign hair score or weight to the, sec uh, to the first tuple, it direct object and food rather than the second one, we can say that it understands the common sense knowledge that we are more likely to eat food rather than rock. Um, of course, uh, these two kinds of relations are not enough to cover all the common sense knowledge. So people start to extend the definition of SP to other dependency relations like the subject. So for example, it is more likely for a singer or person to sing rather than the horse, but that is still not enough. So in ACL last year, we tried to further extend the idea of SP to second order. The motivation is that sometimes humans do not have a strong preference for the subject or object of specific events, but they do have the preference about the property of this subject or objects. So as you can see from this WC example, uh, human can solve this problem because we know that hungry is a common property of the subject of it rather than the object. And vice versa, tasty is a common property of the object of it rather than the subject. If we further extend, we will get the higher order selection preference, which describes the common sense knowledge about complex relations between events or states like eating dinner may cause the person to be full rather than hungry. We call it hair order because really the semantic unit here is the eventualities rather than the words. So you need, you need to view each eventuality as a whole. Um, actually to effectively represent all the sexual preference knowledge, we need a eventuality based knowledge graph. Unlike existing knowledge graph, this graph should be probabilistic such that we can use the scores either across different eventualities or inside eventualities to reflect either the higher order or lower order preference. So motivated by this, we developed Acer, which is a large scale eventuality knowledge graph. Um, as you can see from this example, it is essentially a hybrid graph. Like each eventuality here is a hyper edge of words and they have some inner structures here. And there are heterogeneous edges among these eventualities. In the first version, we got 194 million eventualities and 64 million edges, but in the latest version, we have uh, expanded it to billion level. Actually, lots of interesting knowledge can be found from this example. For example, I eat food appears about 3,000 times in the whole Acer, but I eat rock never appears. By comparing these two, we can actually see that the statistics about eventualities actually reflects this lower order sexual preference knowledge, like we are more likely to eat food rather than rock. Besides that, we can also observe some interesting hair order preference knowledge. Like we often make a call before we go away 
and being tired and being hungry often happen together. Okay, so in the next section, I will start to introduce how to construct such a knowledge graph from the texture data. Okay, so as I mentioned, the nodes in Acer are eventualities. Here we require each node to be the smallest semantic complete component that describes a state or event. So basically it cannot be too long, like a whole sentence. Otherwise you may never be able to find some exact match when you try to do some matching and inference. It can also not be too short, like just a word. Otherwise the semantic may be incomplete. Thus to achieve the balance between these two requirements, we propose to use several pattern uh, over dependence graphs to represent all of these eventualities. As for the edges, similarly, we want it to be necessary and complete, but at the same time, it should be easy to be acquired from unlabeled data. Considering these two requirements, we choose to use discourse relations as the edge types. So actually both the dependency and discourse relations can be easily acquired from unlabeled corpus with existing tools like Stanford parser or Spacey. And that is how we can really scale it up. Okay, so I'm gonna first introduce the details about the eventuality patterns, I think. Uh, in specific, in the first version, we designed 14 patterns to extract the eventualities from raw corpus. Of course, these patterns are not perfect. They are just a kind of balanced choice between the quality and the quantity. Uh, currently, the 14 patterns can cover more than 70% of the verbs with good quality. Some examples are like SV here and the dog box or SVO, I love you. Um, besides these patterns, six dependency relations are also treated as auxiliary edges because they also contain some important semantics like the modifier or negations. As these six auxiliary relations are the same for all patterns, so we simply put it here. Uh, actually, we do not require any patterns to contain these edges to be valid, but if you do have, we will also keep them after the extraction. And then I will briefly introduce the quantity and quality of the extracted eventualities. Uh, we extracted those eventualities from an 11 billion token corpus and evaluate the quality with the Amazon Mechanical Turk. As you can see from this result, the overall precision is about, yeah, about 80% accuracy, which is pretty good, especially considering that we do not use any annotations. Um, one important reason for that is our extraction algorithm is actually quite strict. So our principle is that we only want to extract eventuality when our system is very, very confident. Otherwise we don't. Because the quality is the most important thing to a knowledge graph. As for the scale, of course, scale is also important, but since our approach is unsupervised and we can easily increase it by scanning over more data. So for example, as you can see here, we got about 1 million to 100 million eventualities for each type uh, by scanning over uh, 11 billion token coppers. As for the edges, uh, for me, sorry, do we have a question? Yeah, uh, so it seems that this technique can suffer a lot from uh, reporting bias uh, because my, like when talking about common sense, many of the things that uh, are like obvious to people, so they don't write about them. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly why I'm gonna introduce how to further enhance it with other techniques. Yeah, texts are not perfect, they are not good enough. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, so basically, the performance here is based on uh, precision, right, and not recall. Yeah, precision, not recall. We we can we actually sacrifice the recall here. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, as for the edges, uh, which are just the uh, discourse relations, so we first use those connectives annotated by pen discourse tree bank to determine the relations. We call them the seed relation because we are going to introduce a bootstrapping framework based on that later. Uh, actually, many connectives have been annotated in the pen discard tree bank, but only a small portion of them are deterministic. So for example, the connective so that here, it appears 30 times uh, in the whole annotation, but every time it appears, it means the same uh, discard relation, the result. Uh, as a comparison, the connective while appears many times in the whole corpus, but as it's so ambiguous, we couldn't really use it and all of the selected patterns are shown in this table. Okay, so here is one example showing how we do it. If you observe a sentence like, I eat food because I'm hungry, after extracting the eventualities, we will get two, event, two eventualities here, I eat food and I'm hungry. And then we see a 
meaningful connectivity here because we would thus create an edge between them. Uh, of course, if you simply apply these seed connections, the result decay would be very sparse because compared with eventualities, the connectives are not that often expressed explicitly. And to solve this problem, we propose a bootstrapping framework to increase the edges iteratively. So basically the idea is that for each iteration, we first train a classification model based on the knowledge we have collected, and then we use it to predict the discourse relation in the new sentences. So basically we are trying to predict the implicit discourse relations. And here are some results. Uh, we got 64 million edges in total, and here are the distributions and the qualities. Uh, as you can see from these results, in general, the distribution of relations types are not balanced. Some of the relations appear 8 million times, while others only appear 6,000 times. But I think it's okay because it reflects the nature of human language. As for the quality, it's a little bit, it's, again, it's only about precision. Uh, it's a little bit worse than the eventualities because the higher order selectable preference knowledge is more complex. Uh, but I think it's a good start and we are keep improving it. So in the end of this section, I would like to compare the sets of Acer versus all other web-based knowledge resources. As Acer is automatically extracted from unlabeled textual data, we can easily make it very huge, like it's 100 times larger than all of the other resources and 1,000 times larger than the concept nets. Um, yeah, I'm, so after introducing how to construct Acer with text, I would then introduce how to further enhance it with other modality, basically. Okay, so the first trial we made is the eventuality conceptualization and the motivation is actually very simple, the sparsity problem. So if you think this way, just like you know, I said, the eventuality is actually the combination of actions and entities due to the complexity of human language, there could be huge amount of such combinations. And it's quite possible that many of them has never been observed in any of the documents that we have. Not to mention that the combination of these eventualities, like you have to appear in the same sentence, is almost impossible to capture all of them. Um, here is one example. In Acer, we can find that, that the knowledge that Google acquires DeepMind can result in stock have increased because they appeared in some sentence in some of the documents we have. As a comparison, even though we can find Apple acquires drive.ai in Acer, but we couldn't really link it to stock because these two eventualities didn't appear in the same sentence in all the corpus we have. Not to mention that some eventuality like Microsoft acquired GitHub with just hyphen are not in Acer at all because we, our data simply didn't cover it. So how can we solve the sparsity problem and transfer the knowledge we have about Google to Microsoft becomes crucial for Acer to be really useful. So, and here is how we try to solve it. Actually, the idea is very simple and straightforward. We try to conceptualize all of these eventualities to a more abstract level. So here by conceptualization, we mainly regard to the conceptualization of nouns or non-compounds, such as the company acquires startup company. Um, to do so, we try to link a service probates which recalls the hypernym relation among non or non phrases. And here is one example. Assume that we have seen this event, Obama have dog. And by searching in probates, we can know that Obama is a kind of politician and dog is a kind of animal. And we can get some eventuality like politician have animal. And then we can add it to the, and all of these associated edges in Acer without really seeing it in any of the documents. Of course, there could be some error propagation here. Um, because during this conceptual phase, we do not really consider the context, which is not perfect. But as the principle of Acer is not like every edge in Acer should be fact, it's really not. Everything in Acer is probabilistic. As long as the more plausible connection has larger weight or larger score, we are good to go. And here to achieve that goal, we, including, we include all of this probability score given by the probes. Uh, as you can see here, basically we multiply all of them together. So generally speaking, this created eventualities has much less weight than the real eventualities we observed from the doc or with directly from the document because we need to multiply these scores together. So it won't significantly influence the overall quality. As a result, we successfully expand the first version of Acer, which has 194 million eventualities and 64 million edges into the second one, which has uh, 
1 billion unitaries and 10 billion edges, which is much bigger and denser, actually. Another challenge we are facing is that some common sense knowledge is never formally expressed in written language, especially the causality, causal knowledge between eventualities, because we all assume that the listener or reader already know that, so we won't really write it down for the efficiency of the communication. But lucky for us, such knowledge can be found in many other modalities like the visual signals. So in this work we just submit to AAAI this year, uh, we try to explore the possibility of learning some causal knowledge from the visual signals. Here is one simple example, like these two images are taken from the YouTube, uh, screenshots from the YouTube video. By viewing this video, actually annotators agree that playing croquet is actually the cause of walking on the grass because he needs to collect the ball back. So we were just wondering if it is possible for the system to automatically identify such knowledge from videos. And to achieve this goal, we first leverage the scene graph model from CV community to identify some eventualities from the videos and then propose a joint model uh, to predict whether there exists certain causal relation between them or not. As for the result, uh, here is a case study showing the effect of the learned model. Uh, given the event wash car in the first image, our system can predict that it may cause the result that the grounds get wet or the car is clean. Yeah, which actually uh, could be a great supplement for the current answer. Of course, the model also make mistakes, right? So for example, it wrongly predicts some eventualities like car changes color or man sees the car. They are either wrong by themselves or not really caused by the washing events. Um, I think this example shows that Maybe in the future, we need to leverage the knowledge in Acer to help understand this video and then use the new observed knowledge to enhance Acer so that we can increase its coverage and quality via a kind of self-learning mechanism. But anyway, I think this example actually shows that we can use Acer as the bridge to connect different modality and thus has the potential to fully solve the common sense reasoning problem. So as the last part of my presentation today, I would like to introduce several applications of Acer we have been trying. Okay, so yeah, the first one is also the most straightforward one is direct match and inference, right? So as shown in this example, we support eventuality-based inference, basically given one eventuality and one reason, we can predict the most possible eventuality. We also support edge-based inference, given two eventualities, we can predict the edge between them. More importantly, Acer actually support long distance inference, like uh, which is actually very challenging for language models because these two hops may, may be extracted from totally irrelevant documents or even different modalities, but they are connected together in Acer. Here is a simple example showing why such inference could be helpful. Um, so if you ask your robot, like I cannot find my code, with all the support of Acer, a smart robot should be able to say, okay, I will find the code for you. But with the support of Acer, it may start to think you cannot find your code. Does that mean you are feeling cold right now? So maybe he will say that, okay, I will find your code. By the way, do I need to turn on the heater? Something like that. So I think this example shows that without Acer, you can still understand semantics, right? But with Acer, you can understand both the semantic and implicator, basically something you haven't really said it out. Uh, another application of Acer is that we actually try to convert it into other formats like the consummate. The motivation is that most existing common sense reasoning models are built upon the consummate. And by connecting them together, we can actually use these models and see how the knowledge we collected can help downstream tasks. So basically in this EJK work, uh, we first leverage a pattern mining algorithm to automatically mine some higher order SP patterns for different common sense relations defined in the concept net. And then we train a graph based ranking model with the very tiny data to rank all of the extracted knowledge. As for the result, uh, we successfully convert Acer into trans OMCS, which is in the format of concept net, but 100 times larger uh, with acceptable quality, of course, not as good as the original one. And more importantly, uh, compared with other learning-based approach like Comet, the knowledge we transferred from Acer are actually much more novel. We can get very new, a lot of new knowledge. 
I think this result is quite encouraging because it does not only show the transferability from linguistic knowledge, basically SP, to common sense knowledge defined by humans, but also how proves that the proposed SP-based methodology can really effectively represent the common sense. Uh, to conclude my presentation today, I would like to compare our approach with some other common sense representation methodologies. So the first one is, of course, the most traditional one, the human-defined triplets, like ConceptNet. Uh, I think our advantage is clear because, first of all, we are probabilistic rather than fixed, so it can better reflect preference. And also, it is very cheap, so we can make it huge. I think more importantly, it's more machine friendly because it, the, pre the preference or the score is can directly reflect humans' preference about these entities, states, or events. Um, well, there is no free lunch, so overall the quality is not good as the constant net. Compared with uh, the implicit representation like language models, I'm sure you must be curious about this one. As we are so different from each other, Acer has actually many pros and cons. So for example, Acer supports statistical inference, just like the one shown before. Acer can be easily enhanced with other modalities like knowledge graphs or visual signals. And it can support online learning or unsupervised learning settings. More importantly, I think the solution given by Acer is explainable. So basically more machine, uh, more human friendly. At least we can know why it makes mistakes and how can we improve it. Of course, uh, it also has some disadvantages. So for example, it still requires large storage and computational cost. I'm talking about the inference phase, not the training. So because for training, the language models also require huge computation capacity. Uh, also, we do not have that strong ability to feed data. So basically it means that if you have a lot of good enough data, training data, you just go ahead with the language models. But if you do not, you may consider some other techniques. I think the comparison here shows that we are not trying to replace BERT or ConstantNet with Acer. What we are trying to do here is using Acer as a kind of hub to represent common sense knowledge and thus connect different modalities. And then we can solve this common sense reasoning problem by decomposing it into two parts, like how to acquire knowledge and how to apply knowledge. You can use whatever tool you want to answer these questions. You can use human annotation to collect knowledge. You can use language model to apply the knowledge, no problem. But in the end, I think the most important thing is that we need to be, we need to be clear about how to represent this knowledge. Uh, yeah, I think this is that. And I would like to acknowledge all the help I received from my, uh, my collaborators. And yeah, here is the project page, all the codes and papers, demos, you can find it here. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. I don't record the time. How much time is it? Sorry. Yeah, no, you're just right. We're five, uh, like 40 past. So, okay, yeah. no problem. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Uh, so we got a few questions.